Hello and happy February. I am Jean Poole. I am the editor-in-chief of the HR02 Journal. Welcome to the February podcast. We have nine articles in this issue. The first paper is a review article. This is part two of the paper by Dr. Belhassen from last month's part one, highlighting the contributions of Israeli electrophysiologists to the foundation and historical electrophysiologic principles and research. Dr. Belhassen noted that much of the work done by Israeli electrophysiologists was in collaboration with French electrophysiologists. And in this paper, he specifically focuses on the early work of the French electrophysiologists. I think the readers will really enjoy the paper. It is always important to understand how we got to where we are today from standing on the shoulders of the discoveries of those before ourselves. The next paper is titled Association Between Frailty and In-Hospital Outcomes in Patients Undergoing Leadless Pacemaker Implantation, a Nationwide Analysis by Dr. Carlos Diaz Arocutipa and colleagues. The background of this paper is that leadless pacing has emerged as a promising therapy, but that the impact of frailty on the prognosis of these patients is not well known. The authors use the national inpatient sample from 2017-2019 to assess frailty, which was evaluated using the hospital frailty risk score and stratified into low, intermediate, and high risk. Their primary outcomes were in-hospital mortality, any complication, and the secondary outcomes were length of hospital stay and total charges. A total of 16,825 patients were included in the analysis, and 62% of these were considered to be at intermediate or high risk of frailty. Their key findings were that first, frailty was an independent predictor of in-hospital mortality in patients undergoing needless pacemaker implantation. Secondary, frailty was not associated with any complication, vascular, pericardial, pneumothorax, infectious, or device-related. Thirdly, frailty was associated with higher total charges and longer hospital stay. The authors concluded that frailty was common in patients undergoing needless pacemaker implantation. Higher levels of frailty were a strong predictor of in-hospital mortality, length of hospital stay, and hospital charges, but not for any complication. There's a great editorial that accompanies this paper by Drs. Mary Gleva and Karen Joint Maddox. The title of the editorial is Only the Strong Survive, the Impact of Frailty on Patients Undergoing Leadless Pacemaker Implantation. The title of the next paper is Assessment of Patient Characteristics Influencing the Complexity of Leadless Pacemaker Implantation. The first author is Dr. Hiroshi Miyama and colleagues. The background of this paper is that the complexity of leadless pacemaker implantation varies widely and that predictive factors determining the difficulty are not well understood. So the purpose of the study was to evaluate those factors influencing leadless pacemaker implantation di difficulty specifically looking at procedural time during right atrial and right ventricular manipulation, basing on patient background, cardiac function, and anatomic characteristics. The analysis included leadless pacing implantation cases between 2017 and 2023. The key findings were that, first, amongst 54 patients undergoing leadless pacemaker implantation, Right ventricular dilation and severe tricuspid regurgitation were independently associated with prolonged procedural and fluoroscopy times. Second, although two cases of dislodgement occurred, no major complications, including pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade, were reported, thus underscoring the inherent safety of leadless pacemaker implantation. And thirdly, evaluation of the anatomic features identified by pre-procedural echocardiography could provide important insights into optimizing the safety and efficiency of leadless pacemaker implantation. The next paper's title is Adherent Skin Barrier Drape Use is Associated with a Reduced Risk of Cardiac Implantable Device Infection results from a prospective study of 14,225 procedures by first author Dr. Mirdad Golian and colleagues. The background in this paper is that CIED infections are costly and can be highly morbid. Perioperative interventions have been explored, including the use of antibiotic pouches and intensified perioperative antibiotic regimens. The latter have shown marginal efficacy in reducing CIED infection. These authors sought then to evaluate whether the adherent skin barrier drape used is associated with a reduction in CIED infection or not. This is a prospective registry of CIED implantation procedures that were performed at the Ottawa Heart Institute between January 2007 and 2008. 
This study covers a 13-year period and a total of 14,225 procedures. The key findings are that first, in this prospective observational study, the use of an adherent skin barrier in CIED implant procedures significantly reduced the risk of hospitalization for device infection by 68% as compared with not using an adherent skin barrier. Second, the use of an adherent skin barrier reduced CIED-related infections, specifically device pocket infection rates, and CIED-related infections in de novo procedures. Third, the use of an adherent skin barrier showed no discernible effect on the incidence of systemic infections and secondary seeding of the CIED devices. The authors conclude that their study results suggest that the use of an adherent skin barrier during the index procedure may reduce the risk of cardiac device infection. The title of the next paper is Impacted Implantation Depth and Calcium Burden on Infranodal Conduction Delay After Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement by Dr. Andrea Papa and colleagues. The background of this study is that infranodal conduction disorders occur quite commonly after CAVR procedures and that risk factors are not completely understood. The authors sought to then assess the impact of valve implantation depth and calcium burden on the device landing zone on infranodal conduction intraprocedure pre and post TAVR. They looked at all patients undergoing TAVR between June 2020 and June 2021, measuring the HV interval pre and post valve deployment. They then looked at the difference between the two measurements that was defined as the delta HV. The valve implantation depth was measured as the distance between the aortic annular plane and the ventricular prosthesis end. Calcium burden was quantified as the volume of the calcium region of interest. The authors conclude in their key findings that patients with infranodal delay after transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, show higher calcium volume at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract, especially in the region underlying the non-coronary cusp, in comparison to patients with normal atrial ventricular conduction. They also note that left ventricular outflow tract non-coronary cusp calcification was a significant predictor of infranodal conduction delay post-TAVR. Third, the calcium volume at the level of the aortic valve did not differ between patients with infranodal delay and those with a normal HV interval. And finally, in comparison to patients with normal AV conduction, implantation depth was similar to patients with a prolonged HV interval, whereas implantation depth was significantly deeper in patients undergoing periprocedural pacemaker implantation. The title of the next paper is A Pilot Study of Longitudinal Changes in Neurocognition, White Matter, hyperintensities, and cortical thickness in atrial fibrillation patients following catheter ablation versus medical management by Dr. Hannah Schwenison and colleagues. The background of this study is that cerebral microembolization and atrophy complicate atrial fibrillation. These authors aim to compare the changes in neural imaging findings between AF patients treated with catheter ablation and those treated with medical therapy. The authors evaluated the differences in the change in regional white matter hyperintensity burden and cognitive function from baseline to six weeks and one year in patients treated with AF ablation and patients treated with medical management alone. The patients were recruited from the outpatient heart rhythm clinics at Duke University Hospital and included a total of 23 patients, 12 who underwent catheter ablation and 11 patients who were managed medically with antiarrhythmic drug therapy. The author's key findings are that atrial fibrillation patients treated with medical therapy had greater cortical thinning over one year than patients treated with catheter ablation. Second, there was no difference in the change in the cognitive function between patients treated with medical therapy and those treated with catheter ablation. And third, there was also no difference in periventricular white matter hyperintensity burden between the groups. The changes in attention and concentration were inversely correlated with white matter hyperintensity burden. The next paper by Dr. Brian Wu and colleagues is titled Characterizing Cardiac Contractile Motion for Non-Invasive Radio Ablation of Ventricular Tachycardia. The background for this study is that respiratory motion management strategies are used to minimize the effects of breathing on the precision of stereotactic radiotherapy ablation for VT. The author's objective was to assess the magnitude of cardiac contractile motion between different directions and locations in the heart. The study included patients with intracardiac leads or valves who underwent four-dimensional cardiac CT scans prior to a catheter ablation procedure for atrial or ventricular arrhythmias at two medical centers. 
The study included 31 pre-ablation cardiac four-dimensional cardiac CT scans. The key findings are that the degree of cardiac contractile motion varies across patients ranging from 1 to 15 millimeters, and secondary, cardiac contractile motion differed significantly across locations in the heart and was greatest in the right atrial appendage with a vector mean of 11.6 millimeters and LV lead with a vector mean of 8.6 millimeters, while it was less at the aortic annulus with a vector mean of 6.1 millimeters. The authors conclude that no single clinical characteristic predicted the magnitude of cardiac motion. The final paper in this issue is titled Pericarditis Prophylactic Therapy After Sinus Nodes Sparing Hybrid Ablation for Inappropriate Sinus Tachycardia and Postural Orthostatic Sinus Tachycardia by Dr. Carla de Asmundis and colleagues. The background of this paper is that pericarditis is the most common complication following hybrid sinus node sparing ablation for IST and POT syndrome. The study sought to evaluate the association of prophylactic therapy on the risk of symptomatic pericarditis following this procedure. The authors included all consecutive patients that underwent a hybrid ablation of symptomatic IST or POTS and who were refractory or intolerant to drugs, and they were then re retrospectively analyzed. They had a total of 221 patients who were included in their analysis. Their key findings included one, that after hybrid sinus node sparing, inappropriate sinus tachycardia ablation, asymptomatic pericarditis can be diagnosed in 18.1% of patients receiving prophylactic treatment compared to the 52.8% of patients not receiving prophylactic treatment with a 73% relative risk reduction. Second, patients undergoing prophylactic therapy demonstrated a significantly lower heart rate post-hybrid ablation compared with patients not receiving prophylactic therapy. And finally, the prophylaxis therapy was well tolerated and none of the patients discontinued the drug prematurely. Well, this ends the February 2024 podcast. As always, I thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed hearing about these studies and I will talk to you again next month.